Excellency Dr. Carlos Lopez, Under Secretary General and the Executive Secretary of UNECA, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Addis Ababa for the AIDS African Development Forum. The regular participation since the, forum is the forum's inception by a broad array of high-profile stakeholders in Africa, Africa's development, is a testament to this. It is important as a platform for discussing and advancing strategies to propel Africa's economic transformation. The theme of this year forum, Governing and Harnessing Natural Resources for African Development, is timely and monumentally important. I am hopeful that your deliberations will yield concrete and innovative programs for the effective management and utilization of our continent's resources. Excellencies, Africa continues to be characterized by a stark dualism. Bountiful natural resources on the one hand and the abject poverty of its people on the other. Africa's global share of minerals parallels its rich endowment in other natural resources. Despite the abundance of its resources and robust growth over the last few years, Sub-Saharan African share of global GDP stands at less than a minuscule 2%. Clearly, we have been unable to use our resources as a catalyst for our economic growth. Some co commentators, however, have taken a different view of the relationship between resource wells and the economic underdevelopment. They assert that the abundance of resources in and of itself has debilitating effect on our development endeavors, that plentiful resources do not bluster or bolster, but actually hinder development. The more extreme proponents of this perspective seemingly ascribe all ills affecting our continent from corruption to inefficiency and in state institutions to underperforming private sector or to our natural resources. This explanation of our economic woes has been termed as resource scarce. We must reject this line of thinking categorically and unequivocally. Doing otherwise would mean succumbing to fatalism and defeatism. It would also mean endorsing a view which is just plainly wrong. After all, resource-rich countries like Norway have attained high level of development as have resource-poor states like South Korea and Japan. Attributing primarily blame for our backwardness to the plethora of resources at our disposal is a fundamental misdiagnosis of our economic predicament. As one observer aptly put it, saying that natural resources are a curse is like saying that all children born into a rich family will fail in life because they will, go, they will get spoiled by their inherited wealth. Some do exactly for this reason, but there are many others who take advantage of their inheritance and become even more successful than their parents. Excellencies, resources are ultimately as valuable and beneficial to our economies as well as we make them out to be. There are certainly multiple reasons why we have failed to make judicious use of them. Among the most important of these reasons, perhaps the most important reason is the inadequacy of our resource-related policies. I want to highlight a few of these policy deficiencies 
which I hope will, uh, will be addressed in your deliberations over the course of the next few days. One of the most significant factors impeding effective and sustainable use of our resources is that we continue to exploit them in the same way as colonial era administrations rapaciously extracted resources to prop up their home economies. Now, as was the case then during the scramble for Africa, there is seldom any value added to the natural resources we exploit and few linkages to other sectors of our economies. The failure to add value to our exported natural resources leads us to reap lower earnings than we would otherwise receive. Whereas the failure of linkage means that we are missing out an opportunity to grow other sectors of our economies. Surely we can all agree to put it mildly that it is exceedingly paradoxical for Antwerp to be a major center for diamond cutting when Africa exports the bulk of the world's diamonds. It's similarly absurd that some of us export considerable amount of crude oil only to import refined petroleum products from somewhere else. We must craft and implement policies which reverse this perverse state of affairs. Our policies must also emphasize transparency in the use of resource-derived uh, earnings and prioritize the spending of monies on projects most likely to deliver the greatest benefit to broad sectors of our societies. The case of Botswana is illustrative. At independence, Botswana had 12 kilometers of paved road, 22 university graduates, and 100 secondary school graduates. Yet, today, Botswana is a middle-income country. For Botswana, diamonds turn out not to be a curse, but a blessing. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, no two countries are the same and not all of us have diamonds. But I do believe that there are certain lessons to be learned from the experience of Botswana. These include the wise decision to create a national fund for diamond wells, the resistance against the urge to mine diamonds too quickly in order to ensure that they be mined at a pace allowing Botswana to spend profits responsibly and the selection of projects to be funded by the national fund on the basis of the economic returns they would generate for the economy. Apart from being transparent, ethical, and maintaining a long-term perspective, we need to ensure that our natural resources take center stage in our development plans. This can be done in a myriad ways, including by encouraging public-private partnerships, ensuring that resources are ex exploited sustainably with an eye towards preserving them for future generations, and by not regarding agriculture, relegating agriculture and the rural parts of our country to the periphery of our economic plans. Here in Ethiopia, we have steps to ensure that natural resources are placed front and center in our development programs. We have, for instance, consistently placed a premier on food security and enhancing and modernizing agriculture out of the conviction that we cannot neglect a sector employing the vast majority of our citizens. We seek to modernize and link agriculture to industry, for example, by encouraging and increasing the establishment of food and beverage industries. We have also launched our Climate Resilience Green Economy Initiative to ensure that our economic development has as minimal adverse impact on the environment as we can afford. In multiple areas, we are now reaping the dividends of our efforts to improve exploitation of our natural resources. During this fiscal year, for example, our mining sector has generated revenues for the country of the mo more than $500 million. This is still far below the sector's potential, 
but a significant improvement over the past years. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, many of our countries have begun to think anew about how best to manage and harness our natural resources in order to promote development. And these efforts are bearing fruit. But we can and ought to do much more in effectively using our resources to meet the challenges of our populations, climate change, and legit legitimate demand of our citizens for economic empowerment. Our desire to implement such successful policies has been hindered by insufficient funding and by lack of creative thinking. I am hopeful that your deliberations will help us bridge the knowledge gap and generate viable innovative ideas whose implementation will promote the goal of ensuring a better livelihood for our continent's people. I wish you a fruitful deliberations and a pleasant stay in Ethiopia, and I thank you.